This morning, the president's diagnosis. What will it mean politically if Trump remains quarantined in the final weeks of the election? MJ Hagar just announced millions of dollars from donors. Could her latest fundraising figures change the U.S. Senate race here in Texas? Hagar is with us from Round Rock. It's Shelley Luther versus Drew Springer in their runoff for a seat in the state Senate. The high profile race in North Texas attracting national attention. We'll talk to Springer in a moment about the weeks ahead. And Texas Democrats have a strategic goal for next month's election. Manny Garcia, the party's executive director, tells us how likely it is they'll achieve it. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good Sunday morning to you. Of course, the biggest political news right now, President Trump and the First Lady being treated for COVID. We'll spend some time on that later in this program here. Before we get too far in, though, a reminder that tomorrow is the last day to register to vote in the November election. So if you know anyone who is not registered, make sure you let them know Monday is the deadline. Let's get you caught up now on some of the political headlines happening across our state. Proclamations by governors are often fairly routine, but Governor Greg Abbott made international news with one a few days ago. By now, you've seen that he ordered counties to only open one single drop off location for mail in ballots. This is for folks who request a mail in ballot, fill it out and decide then to drive it in rather than mail it back in. Harris County and Travis County are among the places that will now have to close multiple sites. Democrats say it is another blatant effort to suppress the vote. Take a look at this here. It's the mugshot for the Williamson County Sheriff just north of Austin, Robert Chody here. A grand jury indicted Chody for tampering with evidence. The indictment alleges that the sheriff ordered video to be deleted that showed his deputies tasering a black man in a deadly traffic stop last year. It's a third degree felony and if convicted, the sheriff himself could face up to 10 years in prison. And with all that is going on, you might have missed this. The Trump administration says it will again reduce the number of refugees that the U.S. will accept. Next year, only 15,000 of them are welcome here. That's the lowest number in 40 years, the Texas Tribune reports. On average, 95,000 refugees a year have come to the states and many of those have settled here in Texas. Now to that special election in North Texas last week. It had people across the country watching it. This is for a seat in the Texas Senate. It's District 30 and includes cities like Wiley and McKinney over to Denton and Decatur and then from Weatherford up to Wichita Falls, 14 counties in all. Six candidates competing, which guaranteed a runoff and making the cut Shelley Luther, the Dallas salon owner who ignored the governor's order to close down during the pandemic and state rep Drew Springer, a Republican who already represents part of the area for the Texas House. We invited both on our program this morning. Luther had a family situation and agreed to appear later, but we did speak with Representative Springer. Representative, congratulations on making the runoff. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. This special election, it was tense, and I'm curious why you think this Republican race is so contentious and was so contentious. You know, I think that uh, any any time you have a Senate seat, uh, you know, there's a lot of people com, uh, competing for it. You know, and I think that uh, in part of the reason it was contentious is, you know, you had really normally a six month campaign boiled down to 36 days. And so I think all those energies, all those excitements, all those talking points had to get out in a short period of time. And each of us are trying to define our own self as well as sort of saying, here's maybe what my opponent left out. And your opponent obviously is, is very unconventional with, with uh, you know, no political background, no political experience, rather. Um, she's obviously nationally known for defying the governor's order during the, during the shutdown. But how difficult do you think that will be to overcome, considering you guys virtually tied in the special election? No, you know what? We were excited where we finished in the uh, special election. I mean, look, I ran against a national celebrity. He's been on uh, Fox News multiple times, even during the campaign. You know, I represent roughly four counties, but it's like less than 10 percent of the population. So I'm having to introduce myself in 36 days to the other 90 percent. I'm looking forward to the next uh, several weeks, a um, couple months to be able to get back out on the road, be able to talk to constituents, tell them all the great things that I did for my eight years in the House. But more importantly, what we really need to be looking at going forward for Texas. 
Well, let's talk about that for a moment. Shelley Luther had more money than you in the special election. In the end, 164 votes out of what 68,000 is all that divided you. Talk about your strategy going forward. What is it? And, and what would you tell voters is the main difference between you two? You know, I think, uh, you know, the main difference that we really have is, you know, I'm a proven conservative leader that gets things done. Uh, I believe that Texas should be wide open. I think the governor is way behind on this. It's why I've called for a uh, uh, special session to be able to address those type of issues. I've, I've argued adamantly for the wineries, distilleries, and brew pubs. Um, but, you know, I've worked with the governor on a whole lot of other things. I've been married 29 years. I don't always agree my, with my wife. I don't definitely don't always agree with Greg Abbott on those. But I've worked with him an awful lot. And when I'm talking to people in SD30, you know, they're seeing the fast growth in Collin County, East Parker, Denton. They know they have transportation issues. Prosper's the fastest growing school district in the state. But yet there's rural parts of this district where they need to have broadband as more and more education is being delivered over uh, the Internet. And so, you know, those are the things. And, and the voters want those things to be able to be addressed. They don't want somebody that's going to down, be down there. And all they're down there is to say no and fight with the governor and fight with the other members of the, the legislature. It seems every Republican primary, this one maybe more than others, is all about who's conservative enough. Um, do you think her candidacy represents a split in the Texas uh, Republican Party of Texas? You know, I don't know if I would say it's a split. I think it's a, a little bit more of the anger that, that we're still closed, and, and anger is, is more important maybe for some other than getting things done. Um, but at the same time, you know, a lot of people are looking in and says, but we want to know that you're conservative. And the way you show that you're conservative is, you know, you've voted in Republican primaries. You know, I was there in March voting for Donald Trump when he was being attacked by the Democrats. I was there two years prior to that when Ken Paxton and Ted Cruz were being attacked. You know, Miss Luther's never voted in those. And so, you know, I think a lot of people have questions about whether she truly is a Republican and a conservative. You know, she is now and great. Welcome to the party. That's what Republicans do. We've got a big tent. We want to welcome people in. But I think somebody wants a proven conservative in Austin um, that carries the, the legislation, gets things done. All right. Representative Springer, thank you for the time. Thank you, Jason. Have a great weekend. Holding elections used to be one of the more routine, basic functions of government. This year, Texas courts are in the middle of them, though. Straight ticket voting is the latest. The Republican legislature, you'll remember, abolished it three years ago because Democrats were winning so many judicial races. Courts have had different opinions, though, in recent weeks. The bottom line now is it'll stay the way it is. No straight ticket voting this fall when you go vote. Ross Ramsey is with us from Austin this morning, the co-founder and executive editor of the Texas Tribune. Good morning to you, Ross. Good morning, Jason. How are you? Doing well. You know, straight ticket voting is just one of the issues that have gone to court. There are ongoing cases over a number of things, and including how long early voting should go. What's the strategy behind tying all this up in court? You know, I think people are just disagreeing on how easy it should be to vote during, particularly during a pandemic. The straight ticket voting thing was queued up in 2017. Ron Simmons from Carrollton passed the bill. Um, this is the first election it would be in place. We kind of thought that would be in litigation, but the governor extended early voting. Now he's got fellow Republicans after him on that. Uh, he's closing some of the balloting places where they can accept absentee voting. That's caught in court. A lot of this is going to go right up to the moment voting starts. Wow, it makes for a confusing time for voters. I want to ask you about that proclamation. Governor Abbott ordering that counties can only have one place for Texas voters to personally return mail-in ballots. Abbott says this is about election security. Democrats say it's, it's clear that it's suppression here. Which one is it? You know, it's clear that it makes it harder to vote. He didn't offer any evidence or cite any cases of the kind of voter fraud he might be trying to stop. And really, this goes to big counties where they wanted to have more than one place where they collected absentee votes. People wanted to hand over to them because those people were worried about the Postal Service. So now in every county, there will just be one location unless the courts change this. And this is already on its way to some judges. Wow. All right, Ross, thanks a lot. Back to you in a moment. Coming up, MJ Hagar is with us. Will her huge fundraising numbers change the race at all? And the one thing she would do to the Supreme Court if Texas sends her to the U.S. Senate. Plus, the Texas Democratic Party's one strategic goal in November. Executive Director Manny Garcia reveals it to us when Inside Texas Politics returns. 
MJ Hagar is seeing a late surge when it comes to fundraising. At least her campaign reported bringing in $13.5 million last quarter. That's enough money to make this an even race financially, at least with John Cornyn. But just one of the things that we discussed with her here. MJ, thanks for the time. How's it going? I'm um, good, Jason. How are you? Doing well here. Congratulations on the big fundraising numbers. 13.5 million in the last quarter. The clock is ticking, though, to Election Day, about a month away. How do you put that money to work to get the most bang for your buck in these final weeks? You know, it's really exciting to be in a position where when people learn more about me and John Cornyn equally, then we overtake him in the poll, in the polling. And um, that's exciting because, um, you know, we have every opportunity to win this election. Um, Texans are really fed up with him. He's got a very low approval rating. He hasn't been serving us. He's been legislating like a safe senator. And so looking out for his own special interests and, and I mean, his own self-interest and, and the wealthy special interests and his party leadership and um, the more Texans learn about his record and how his votes and his actions don't match his words and the things that he promises us, um, they're starting to see that we need to replace him. But, but I presume with, with a bank account like that, you're probably spending money on ads, direct mail, things like that. Should, should Texans get ready for a barrage of this stuff? I mean, I think we're used to that in election season, but it's nice to be hearing from two sides instead of one like we normally do in Texas. I want to ask you about money is one thing, but but you're still eight points down in the most recent polls that I've seen from Quinnipiac a few days ago. How do you close that gap with so little time remaining? We don't make any decisions based on polls. So that's that's John Cornyn's uh, purview, um, you know, because the polling I've, I mean, I've seen polls with us one point down. I've seen. Um, I just, the, the, the polling only calls on people who have a reliable history of voting. And we've been one of the worst voting turnout states in the, in the union. And now with, that we're setting turnout records, um, a lot of people who are showing up to vote are not reflected in the polling. Uh, we were polling 15 or 20 points down last cycle in the congressional that I ran in the district that was very gerrymandered to be much better than the rest of the state. And we lost by, I think, 2.9 against the guy who won his last midterm by 32 points. And so you just, you can't, you can't, I know that people are anxious and they want to know how these elections are going to turn out because they really impact people. Um, but you have to resist the temptation to, to be able to predict things just based on looking at polling. There is a lot of anxiety. Let me ask you about debates. You have asked for three debates against John Cornyn. Only one has been scheduled. How realistic is it, do you think, that the other two would happen? Oh, I don't think that's going to happen because he has shown time and again that he's afraid to be, to go up side by side with me. Um, the recent Austin American Statesman Ed Board is a really good example of this. That um, traditionally they they interview two candidates together and then both candidates agree to their video being published. And John Cornyn insisted that his video not be published and insisted that he would not be. Um, side by side with me. So that should tell you how he feels about um, how dangerous it is to his election, um, you know, his reelection chances. The more opportunities that Texans have to see us side by side and be able to compare our two visions for this state, although I will say um, it, it may sound a lot alike because he says a lot of the things that I'm actually fighting for. Um, but, you know, I think the more opportunities that Texans have to see us side by side, the better our chances. And he knows that. And so he's fighting like hell to, to try to keep people from being able to have enough information to go to the polls and choose the person who's more, more closely aligned with their values. I want to ask you briefly in our final moments here, pretty quickly, if you can here, MJ, Supreme Court, um, if, if elected, you would have a vote on the next justice uh, to be you know, nominated and uh, confirmed to the Supreme Court. What should the next president do? Should the next president expand the Supreme Court like you know, Democrats have talked about packing the court? I think we need term limits, frankly, Jason. I think that term limits, um, the judges are getting appointed younger and younger. We're living longer and longer. Um, and in order to make sure that we have people on the bench that are not disconnected from the values of our country and not disconnected from the challenges of the regular everyday people who are boots on the ground in this country, um, that the best thing to do is to have term limits. All right. MJ Hagar, thank you so much for the time. Good luck. Thank you, Jason. All right, let's zoom out now to a statewide look at Texas Democrats. The state party is the biggest it has been in a generation, most organized as well. The executive director of the Texas Democrats is Manny Garcia. He is our guest on the latest episode of our Yolitics political podcast. Here he is talking to me and co-host Jason Wheeler. You know, we've said it all along. Texas is the biggest battleground state in the country. There's a tremendous amount of excitement about what's going on. And uh, in the last couple of weeks here, we're going to see how it all plays out. 
Manny, even those polls that would show Trump with a three-point lead in Texas, talk about historically how big of a deal that is for people who are new to Texas. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, you you come from uh, a period in time where, where first of all, I mean, the, the, it, uh, a presidential race hasn't been contested in Texas in over 25 years, right? Um, and you look at 2016 for the first time in two decades, we became a single-digit state. We did better than Iowa and just the same as Ohio. And what was crazy is during that period of time, our volunteers were calling Iowa and Ohio in the GOTV period instead of calling Texans, right? <laughs> you move, you fast forward two more years, you look at 2018, we narrowed that statewide gap all the way to two and a half points with Beto at the top of the ticket. Um, but you, we, we increased our urban dominance. And now you look at the 2020 race and you know, you know back then people said, well, you know, 2018 was a fluke. You had a once in a lifetime candidate in Beto O'Rourke and that was incredibly exciting. Well, in 2016, people were saying, well, Donald Trump was just uniquely unpopular and that, that was just a once in a lifetime kind of thing. Texas is gonna be a double digit state. Well, Donald Trump's back on the ticket. We got more excitement than ever. More people are getting registered to vote. And uh, this is a toss up race and it, it's just incredibly exciting to see it here in Texas. Have you been on the phone with Joe Biden? Or if you could get him on the phone, what do you say to him about in investing in this state? Because we have heard from some Democrats who say that they would like to see the campaign go after this state more aggressively than what they have so far. What I'm very excited about is, you know, they hired a Texas team. They hired, you know, friends of ours, people we know, people that know Texas, people that are from here. Um, and they are, are, are working with us and coordinating with us. Um, on every aspect of, of this campaign, right? And, uh, you know, you come from a time where there had been no presidential campaign presence um, in this state or whatever campaign presence was in this state, you know, was trying hard, but, you know, ultimately was ordered to make phone calls to other states. Mm. And now you're looking at a situation where we are building an organizing effort that calls Texans about the, what's at stake at this, in this election and that gets out the vote for Texans. M Manny, what, what, what's the most likely win on election night for Democrats? Is it the Texas House? Is it MJ Hagar? Is it uh, the presidential race in Texas? What's the most likely win? If, if you could go home with one thing on election night, what is that one thing? And don't say everything, man. What's the one thing you want? I will say the strategic imperative of the Texas Democratic Party is to flip the Texas House. Hmm. This is incredibly important for a generation. There, grab your phone to get the latest episode with Manny. Aim its camera at the QR code there on the right side of your screen. It's going to open up a window on your phone and take you directly to the conversation we had with him. The podcast is called Y'all Ticks. Look for us wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, new episodes drop every Tuesday. When we come back here at Inside Texas Politics, the president's diagnosis with COVID. What will it mean politically if Trump remains quarantined in these final weeks of the election? This is Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley. Time now for Reporters Roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. Ross is back with us. Bud Kennedy from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram is here every Sunday. And, of course, Bernadine Steptoe, the political producer at WFAA in Dallas, is here as well. Ross, let's start with you. Of course, we hope the president does recover from these symptoms he's having and, and continues to do fine. But politically speaking, this looks like it's the fabled October surprise. It takes him off the road at a time when he wanted to be out talking to people. He, um, it looks like... Um, He's canceling some events and, you know, they've got to stay close to the White House. That probably isn't exactly how they wanted to run their campaign. And, and coming off the road, bud, with what, a month left, man, that, that's not good when you're down in the polls. Well, most of all, it's very costly. He had a fundraising event planned in Houston that he's had to cancel. He can't raise as much money on Zoom. He really wanted to be out fundraising. He's trailing in the money game. This really hurts his fundraising more than it hurts his voter support. That's a good point. Bernadine, what's your take on this politically? Well, I think that he's going to miss the large crowds because he feeds off of those crowds and he, he won't be able to go out now because of uh, the COVID-19. But I think he, his campaign will be, well, this will have an impact on all aspects of his campaign. And Ross, also, I'm thinking it throws debates up in the air. Also, we're less than two weeks away from the second presidential debate in Miami on the 15th of October. How likely are, are uh, the remaining debates? 
Well, I, you know, you're seeing right now we can do a lot of things on Zoom that we didn't used to know that we could do. I guess you could do a presidential debate like that. You know, there was a lot of talk about, you know, being able to turn off the mics of the candidates so they wouldn't be talking over each other. That might make that easier. That, that might make it definitely easier these <laughs> days. Uh, Bud, go ahead. You're about to say something. J Jason, let's not get too carried away. I mean, this could be a 10 day story. I mean, he, you know, he could go through some sort of symptoms and and recover and be back out. And actually, he could be back out in time for the next debate. Uh, you know, th this is really not something, uh, this is not necessarily something that's going to have a long term impact. It just hits at a really tough time for him. Uh, gearing up the final stretch of the campaign. Yeah, indeed so. And, and of course, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of England, uh, the UK, he also had it. He, he was out for a while. I think his symptoms were a lot worse. He's, of course, 20 years younger uh, than President Trump as well, too. Bernadine, let's talk about political parties. Does, does the president's diagnosis and his treatment, does that impact races farther down the ballot at all? Does that impact the parties at all? Well, you know, what we talked earlier about the pandemic being part of the election coming November. And I think this has put it back in the forefront. So in terms of those candidates who are uh, campaigning, saying that the pandemic is not as serious, it sort of uh, makes, makes them pause because it is now at the forefront of the election. Yeah, so I think that it will uh, uh, have an impact uh, uh, good, from that perspective. Good point. Uh, Ross, final moments here too. We were talking last week about the Supreme Court. This week is the pandemic. The news cycle changes very fast here uh, in, the, in the remaining weeks, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it does. I think, you know, this could affect turnout in the election. I think the election is going to stay on the forefront. I think the Supreme Court thing is going to stay on track. But like Bud said, this story's got a tail on it and we'll get new news you know, every hour. Yeah, indeed so. Guys, thanks so much. We appreciate it. Thank you for watching as well. We're back again next Sunday with more Inside Texas Politics. Hope you can join us then. Take care.